services, whoever you are, and wherever you are on your faith journey, you are welcome here this day. And we do pray that the transforming love of Jesus might touch your life. So we want to enter into our worship. We want to uh, pass the peace. A reminder, we stay in the pews while we pass the peace. So you can pass it to those next to you and probably behind you, but don't go wandering around. You can flash a peace sign to those across the sanctuary. And, uh, may the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And also with you. Let's pass the peace. reading the call to worship responsibly. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house and thus put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. See, I have not opened the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you an overflowing blessing. I will, rebu I will rebuke the locust for you, so that it will not destroy the produce of your soil, and your vine in the field shall not be barren, says the Lord of hosts. And let us continue together as we enter into this time of worship, O oh God, we ask that might be at work in our lives. Challenge us in how we live and in the decisions we make. So speak to our hearts this morning. May all that we do bring glory to your name. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. streaming now is the darkness vanished away see in this space our fears and our dreamings brought here to you in the light of this day gather us in the lost and forsaken gather us in the blind and the lame call to us now and we shall awaken we shall arise at the sound of our name we are the young our lives are a mystery we are the old who yearn for your face. We have been sung throughout all of history, called to be light to the whole human race. Gather us in the rich and the haughty, Gather us in the proud and the strong. Give us a heart so meek and so lowly. Give us the courage to enter the song. Not in the dark of buildings confining, not in some heaven light years away here in this 
this place the new light is shining now is the kingdom now is the day gather us in and hold us forever gather us in and make us your own gather us in all peoples together fire of love in our flesh and our bone we join together to confess our sins and to receive the assurance of pardon that is offered to us through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us join together in the prayer of confession. O oh God, we have not always been good stewards of what you have given us. We often hoard what we have and not share it with others who are in need. We seek our own comfort while others live in deplorable circumstances. We turn blind eye to those considered least in society. You have given so much to us, and we don't respond in kind. Forgive us, we pray, in Christ's name. Amen. Jesus came to offer life and gave his own life that we might experience the forgiveness of God. In Christ we are forgiven, so let us live lives of gratitude for the grace we have received. Today is Stewardship Sunday in the regards that we are starting our stewardship campaign and we have uh, Mark giving us a uh, a sermon, a wonderful sermon, I'm sure, <laughs> and um, we'll see, he says. <laughs> I'm saying this in faith, just, um, but we, we, one of the things we're starting to do now is to bring the offering into the service as a reminder that we, um, we, we do have, uh, we do receive an offering each week and we, uh, we need to support the work that is being done in our church today. So um, let, us, let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for this time that we can give of our gifts and use them to, for, to build up your church and to work for, the value, work for your kingdom to come. So thank you for uh, providing for us all that we need and giving us opportunities to give back to you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Let us pray together the prayer for illumination. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, may we hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Second Corinthians chapter eight, verses one through five. A little background. Both chapters 8 and 9 of 2 Corinthians can be seen as fundraising letters. Paul is raising money for the poor in Jerusalem. 
In his first letter, in chapter 8, Paul boasts of the generosity of the Macedonian churches in order to stir up the Corinthians to compete in generosity. Paul's key message, their generosity must match their faith, wisdom, knowledge, and love. Hear now the words of the Apostle Paul as he encourages his followers to be generous. We want you to know, brothers and sisters, about the grace of God that has been granted to the churches of Macedonia. For during a severe ordeal of affliction, their abundant joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For, as I can testify, they voluntarily gave according to their means and even beyond their means, begging us earnestly for the privilege of sharing in this ministry to the saints. And this, not merely as we expected, they gave themselves first to the Lord and, by the will of God, to us. The word of the Lord.
Our second reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15, verses 11 through 32. This should be a very familiar story for all of us. Then Jesus said there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So the man divided his property between his two sons, and a few days later the younger son gathered all that he had and traveled to a distant country, and there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired hands have bread enough to spare, but here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, <clears throat> His father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. And then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and get the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard the music and the dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. And his father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered the father, listen, for all these years I have worked like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command, yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and re rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. The word of the Lord. Let us pray. Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable today in your sight, for you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Good morning. It's always a pleasure to be here and be able to share worship with you in my home church. And it's a very rare privilege to be here in worship with Barbara. Um, seldom are we in the same place on Sunday mornings. And for those of you who may not be familiar with who I am, my name is Mark Duyard. I'm an elder here. 
But the reason you don't see me here very often is as a commissioned ruling elder, I'm usually doing pulpit supply somewhere else in the presbytery. So it, again, it's a real privilege to be here today. In fact, Barb and I took a European vacation a couple weeks ago, and due to a calendar mix-up on my part, I actually have two free Sundays this month, today and next week. So as chair of stewardship, I offered to relieve Duke of the opportunity to talk about everybody's favorite subject, money. <laughs> For some reason, I don't know why, money and stewardship are uncomfortable words in church. For 11 months of the year, they're hidden away, and then they come rolling out every fall when budget time rolls around and everybody runs from the message. We often think of stewardship in this sense. Johnny was on his way to church one Sunday morning when he stopped by the corner store and he was going to use his Sunday school money to buy candy when the proprietor, who knew the family well, put up his hand and said, son, you should give that money to the church. And Johnny replied, I have a better idea. I'll buy the candy and you give the money to the church. <laughs> We always leave it to someone else to do it. When we hear the word stewardship, we think of money, even though stewardship represents time, talent, and treasure. And here we go again, the church wants my money. I like the story about the associate pastor who chose the following as his church's new campaign slogan. I upped my pledge, up yours. <laughs> So today is the start of our annual campaign, Commitment Sunday, the day that we gather as a church and commit our gifts to God is four weeks from today on November 7th. There's a mailing that will be going out tomorrow with a letter and the usual paraphernalia, and we ask that you look at that and seriously consider. Stewardship is the traditional word churches use most often for their annual giving campaign. And again, we are all stewards of everything that God has given us. However, I prefer to call the campaign by a different name, generosity. And this requires a little bit of a paradigm shift. So let's talk about paradigms for a moment. A paradigm is a pattern of thoughts or beliefs. They're what we believe. So a paradigm shift is to change the way we look at things. Ptolemy, the Greek astronomer, stated that the Earth was at the center of the universe and the sun and all the planets revolved around the Earth. And that paradigm was taken as truth until Copernicus, about 600 years ago, proved that the Earth revolved around the sun. A revolutionary change in thinking, a real paradigm shift. Now, not all paradigm shifts are major changes in our belief systems. They can often be very small or subtle. Stephen Covey, the author, the author of Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, provides another example of what he calls a mini paradigm shift. One Sunday morning, Covey was riding in the subway in Manhattan, and I'll let him tell the rest of the story. People were sitting quietly, some reading newspapers, some lost in thought, some resting with their eyes closed. It was a calm and peaceful scene. And then suddenly a man and his children entered the subway car. The children were so loud and rambunctious that instantly the whole climate changed. The man sat down next to me and closed his eyes, apparently oblivious to the situation. The children were yelling back and forth, throwing things, even grabbing people's papers. It was very disturbing, and yet the man sitting next to me did nothing. And it was difficult not to feel irritated. I could not believe that he could be so insensitive as to let his children run wild like that and do nothing about it, taking no responsibility whatsoever. And it was easy to see that everyone else in the subway car felt irritated too. So finally, with what I felt, was unusual patience and restraint. I turned to him and said, sir, 
Your children are really disturbing a lot of people. I wonder if you could control them a little bit more. And the man lifted his gaze as if to come to a consciousness of the situation for the first time and said softly, oh, you're right. I guess I should do something about it. We just came from the hospital where their mother died about an hour ago. And I don't know what to think, and I guess they don't know how to handle it either. Covey states, can you imagine what I felt at that moment? My paradigm shifted. Suddenly, I saw things differently. And because I saw differently, I thought differently, I felt differently, I behaved differently, my irritation vanished. I didn't have to worry about controlling my attitude or my behavior. My heart was filled with the man's pain. Everything changed in an instant. Now, I hope for, but do not expect such a sudden change in thinking, in believing, in feeling this morning. But my message today is to us is to open our hearts, our minds to new ways of thinking about everything, not just money and generosity, but our families, our church, our community. We need to change the paradigm, our paradigm about stewardship and generosity. And Jesus was the ultimate paradigm shifter. Everything he did, everything he taught, turned the world upside down. Turn the other cheek. Love your neighbor. Give away your possessions and follow me. The list goes on and on. And we have an example today in the story that we just heard in Luke chapter 15. Jesus again tries to change the paradigm. We heard the reading of the prodigal son, but this is actually the third story that Jesus tells in chapter 15 in which he focuses on recovery of what was lost and joyous celebration. Chapter 15 starts with this line. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. And as we have seen throughout the Gospels, when Jesus is facing criticism, he responds with stories. Here he relates three parables, the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and the parable of the prodigal son. All three of these stories focus on God's joy and generosity, welcoming and embracing those that are lost. But of course, the most common of these three stories is the one we heard today, the parable of the prodigal son. Now, there's many ways to look at this parable. We've all heard it at least once a year for all the years that we've been coming to church. And there's many themes buried in the story. There's the theme of sinning or dishonest living as Jesus calls it. Humility, the son eats with pigs rather than go completely hungry. Surrender and repentance, he resigns, the son resigns to return to his father's estate saying, how many of my fathered, father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare. Jealousy, the reaction of the brother who remained behind and begrudged his father's treatment of the brother upon his return. And forgiveness, the father's reaction to the son's plea. The son says, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Each of these themes separately is sermon worthy, and you've probably heard many sermons on these topics. But to me, the key theme here is celebration and how it relates to the definition of prodigal. Timothy Keller, a Presbyterian minister in Manhattan, an author, says, Jesus is showing us the God of the great expenditure, who is nothing if not prodigal towards us, his children. So let's start by looking at the word prodigal. Prodigal comes from the Latin meaning lavish. Webster defines it as spending money or resources freely, recklessly, being wastefully extravagant, having or giving something on a lavish scale, 
or a person who spends money in a recklessly extravagant way. Yes, we can all agree that the son was recklessly extravagant with his half of the inheritance. But what about the father? No sooner does the returning son repent his sins, stating that he is not worthy to be the father's son, but the father calls out, quick, bring him a robe, the best one, and put it on him, and put a ring on his finger, and sandals on his feet, and get the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. And they began to celebrate. Surely the father is being prodigal, recklessly extravagant as well, if not more so. This, after all, is a story of two sons and one father. So let's shift the focus from the sons to the father. Can we all agree that the father represents God in this story? Isn't the father also recklessly extravagant in welcoming his son home? He is the prodigal father. He pulls out all the stops to celebrate his son's return. Like God, his generosity and his joy is limitless. And isn't this the God that we worship and celebrate? A God of unlimited generosity? a God of unlimited grace and forgiveness? So let me ask another question. What would it take, what would it be like for us to be wastefully extravagant? How would our paradigm have to change? When we think of spiritual disciplines, we think of the following, worship, praying, and reading and studying the Bible. Carl Travis, a Presbyterian minister in Fort Worth, Texas, argues that financial generosity is a spiritual discipline as well. Travis says financial generosity is, and I quote, a time-tested practice of faith that deepens our awareness of God and opens our hearts to God's guidance. He goes on to say that we as Presbyterians aren't accustomed to thinking of financial generosity as a spiritual discipline because when we hear pastors or lay leaders speak about money, we suspect that they are motivating us to give to meet the church's budget. And here is the paradigm shift. Thinking of financial generosity as a spiritual practice redirects our attention from the church's need to receive towards the individual's need to give. That is why we receive an offering on Sunday mornings. We do not take a collection. Travis states that the practice of spiritual generosity begins with a promise, a promise to share. We need to trust that the Lord will provide, so we have to begin by trusting that God has already provided for us. Paul is very clear here. God gave us an indescribable gift. Jesus, the Son of God. When we give, God is able to give us more so that we can do more. In other words, God sees to it that the, gener the generous giver will not suffer want. Instead, God generously provides for those who give so that they can continue to do so. So I call on all of us, myself included, to remember that we give because God wants us to be givers. We give not because we must or because the church needs to meet the budget, but because of the blessings that we will receive. Paul says, God will make grace abound toward you. God's church and this church survive regardless of whether we support it financially or not. There was a time in the 1700s when this church was down to two members, and yet we are still here 300 years later. And as time goes on, this church may look different, it might be smaller, it might be bigger, it might not even be in this building, but if God has a need for this church in this community, it will survive and it will flourish. So here is our new paradigm. 
We need to give to the church because it is an integral part of being a disciple and a follower of Christ. It's about having our priorities straight. Giving and giving back is an integral part of being a Christian. In this time of transition at the First Presbyterian Church of Dover, we need to strongly question our paradigms. We need to question our paradigms about who we are and what we want for this church. We need to take a serious look at where God thinks we ought to go. What does this ministry look like in two years, in five years, in 10 years? Paul says, for as I can testify, they voluntarily gave according to their means and even beyond their means begging us earnestly for the privilege of sharing in this ministry to the saints. They gave themselves first to the Lord and by the will of God to us. So today I challenge you again to rethink your paradigms. Think about God's generosity and how, is it, how it has affected your life. I challenge you to think about giving differently, to think about giving as a spiritual discipline not because you have to, but because as Christians, we need to. I challenge you to think about giving, not because you have to, but because you want to share God's abundance. Giving is how we say thank you to God. We say, we say thank you by not storing his blessings, but by sharing them. Amen. Gracious and loving God, you love us extravagantly, far more than we can comprehend. You desire the very best for us, even if we don't always understand what that might be. And so as we kick off this stewardship campaign, we pray that you would shift our paradigms so that uh, we might see our giving as a spiritual discipline, see our giving as a uh, opportunities to be growing spiritually. We pray that uh, we would uh, be generous in our giving, that you would be at work in our hearts, leading us to how much we should give to support the work and ministry of this church. And we ask that through our giving, you will meet the needs of our church. We pray for the town hall meeting that will take place in a few minutes and ask that we'll have a better understanding of, how, uh, of who we are and why we exist and what we need to be doing. We would ask that you guide us in these discussions. And we lift up the small group that will be forming. Uh, and, and again, we, we ask that you would be with these groups as they talk about the, uh, the reason of, of who we are and why we exist and what we need to be. Uh, may these groups help lead us to um, lead us in the next steps we need to take to find our next pastor. We pray for that person even now uh, that you would be preparing us 
in that person uh, so that we might be ready and this person might be ready to receive uh, the call that you would have. We would ask for a good match in effective and productive ministry. We do continue to lift up our prayer list and pray especially for those who are home now and often lonely. We ask that you would comfort them. We pray for those on the list that are in need of healing and ask that you heal them. We lift up those who are grieving the loss of loved ones and ask that you comfort them, turn their sorrow into joy. We know that there are many unspoken prayer requests and we ask that you hear and answer those prayers. We pray all of these things in the name of Jesus and ask that you hear us when we pray the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts.
how God has met with you during this time of worship. And are there things that you need to do in response to what God has, um, how God has met with you? So I would invite you to stand for the benediction. <laughs> So go now.